to the uh, initial talk here on our 2012 IGDA Summit uh, advocacy panel. Uh, please help me welcome from Child's Play, a lady with two first names, Kristen Lindsay. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, everybody. Uh, great, yes, so uh, welcome to the Child's Play session this morning. Um, I'm Kristen Lindsay, and I'm really honored to be here today and to have been invited by the IGDA to come and speak to the, ad um, the advocacy panel. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, how Child's Play is putting video games to work for some kids. Uh, so here's a brief overview of, um, of our history. We were founded in 2003 uh, by Penny Arcade webcomic. And uh, we were originally conceived in response to negative video game stereotypes, something that um, I think we're all uh, trying to fight against. Uh, but we now stand on our own merits as a philanthropic voice for the gaming community. So here's what we do. Um, we partner with pediatric hospitals, uh, mostly in the US, but worldwide as well, to create wish lists. Uh, right now we're using Amazon as our retailer. They have the best system for us. Um, uh, of video game consoles, games, and other things that the child life staff uh, feel will be helpful for the patients. Um, we then encourage the video game community, we drive them towards these lists and ask them to purchase items which are then delivered directly to the hospitals. Uh, we also accept cash donations which are used to purchase additional game equipment. Um, and we also provide some, uh, this is a small grant program we have, but uh, uh, we also do grants to smaller organizations who share our mandate of using video games to improve child welfare. Um, pretty much all of our support comes from uh, community fundraisers and the general, uh, generous assistance from the video game industry. So what do we know? We know that hospitals aren't fun. Uh, the original intention of our program was to support our local pediatric hospital here in Seattle with toy donations uh, that represented our passion as gamers. Um, being in a hospital, either as a patient or a family member of a patient, uh, can be boring, intimidating, painful, scary, overwhelming, all those things. Uh, we knew that many of these factors could be improved by adding electronic entertainment. And when we started out as a program, that was our mandate. It was just, here's something fun, here's something you can do while you're here. Uh, but here's what we're learning. Uh, and these are the essentials. Uh, and these are just, you know, you can scan over those, but I want to tell you, like a couple of years into our program, we started to get some really interesting feedback from sources such as Project Hope at Johns Hopkins and the Hospital for Special Care in New Britain, Connecticut, who were sharing with us some applications of video game equipment that we hadn't previously considered. Um, and I'm sure that these might be familiar to you now, but we were learning for the first time things like a Wii balance board can be used for spinal rehabilitation, um, that the Xbox Live was providing a critical social connection for isolated patients, uh, that a patient with a handheld console had a higher rate of treatment compliance and a lower rate of pain medication requests than a child without. And this feedback was both revelatory and thrilling for us, um, and it expanded our mission. So uh, we can look more closely at a few directions that we've gone in. The title here is a direct quote uh, from the head of a special resource department at an elementary school that I had the honor of visiting. Um, we had provided them with a grant to buy iPads for their resource department this year. And they invited us back to a thank you assembly to see the effect that that donation had had. Uh, the boy on the left here is Stanley. Uh, he's autistic, nonverbal, prone to outbursts, uh, occasionally requires restraints to prevent from injuring himself and others. Um, when I had, I had actually met Stanley a few times previously to this, and thus I was really deeply affected when he brought his iPad up to a projector cart and started to play a virtual piano in front of a crowd of about 300 other students and guests. And he played um, How to Save a Life by the Fray. And it wasn't flawless, but it was one of the most beautiful performances that I'd ever heard. And that moment of watching him express himself creatively and in front of his peers, uh, to great admiration, was very moving for me, um, and a lot of the other people there as well, uh, who realized um, that this was an incredibly huge step for Stanley. Uh, on the right is my own son, Cassiel, and I, I apologize, but it's handy when I don't have to track down the privacy release to use the photo. Uh, <laughs> he's a five-year-old with developmental dyspraxia, um, which is also called developmental coordination disorder. DCD is a neurological disorder that comes with an exciting collection of comorbid conditions, uh, such as apraxia of speech, gross uh, and fine motor dysfunction, 
sensor processing disorder, learning disability, memory and attention deficit, and more. And I've been privileged as a parent to help integrate some of the technology that we talk about and use into his therapy and um, observe firsthand how effective they can be. And the iPad specifically has been one of the most valuable tools, both for myself as a parent and various members of his treatment team. <clears throat> Um, the iPad and the Apple App Store provide an inexhaustible suite of applications for our use. Uh, I sat down um, a while ago with Matt, a clinical psychologist, who showed me some of the software that he's using with great success in the mental health field. Uh, he works primarily with low-functioning patients, non-communicators, um, prone to violence, disassociated from normal life. And he described his clients with great regret as the people that everyone else had given up on. Um, and he said these are the people uh, where the course of treatment is often lock them up and throw away the key. Uh, as a gamer himself, he had reached into that field to try some new tricks. And on the left, he was demonstrating a really simple touch response application, um, something that he would use to introduce an iPad to a client. So uh, they're usually sufficiently intrigued by that sort of software, willing to touch it, explore the cause and effect, and willing to interface with a piece of technology rather than another person. Um, so super, super basic, like this is just, here's this thing, it does stuff. That's, that's basically as simple as it is. Uh, and he described another situation with a patient who wouldn't answer questions when they were spoken to him, but would answer if they were typed out on an iPad. Uh, and so he uses communication suites, like the one on the right, to challenge that communication barrier as well. Um, and software like this can have their vocabulary customized. Uh, to individual patients, and it, it genuinely becomes their voice to the world. <clears throat> uh, and you're going to have to forgive me, uh, but I'm going to say it. There's an app for that. Adaptive speech, ASL guides, emotion interfaces, speech articulation trainers, journal applications, reminder software, anger management tools, creative programs for people with motion deficits, FaceTime, one of the emails that uh, my child's play cohort, Jamie, uh, received earlier this year was from a child's life specialist who told us that she uses iPads with FaceTime uh, so that children in her pediatric facility can talk to their parents in the general hospital when, in cases where the whole family has been involved in an accident. We hadn't thought of that before, and it really puts things in perspective when we hear a story like that and realize how important these tools can be. You know, that's the only way a kid's going to talk to mom and dad when they've all been injured. Uh, it's more than just iPads, and it's more than just children. These photos come to us from the Hospital of Special Care uh, in Connecticut, where they have a room dedicated to wee therapy. Amy, their resource center manager, reported that bowling was the most popular app with the adults, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, she said the older they are, the more hesitant they were to dive into that sort of technology, but they always came around when, uh, when they watched other people doing it. Uh, and I, I love the woman, the older woman, her smile here. It's, you know, you can tell this is the first time that she's ever done anything like this. And it's nice to see physical therapy being fun. Uh, the Wii was really the tip of the iceberg for this sort of application, but now we have the Connect and the PlayStation Move offering related opportunities that are open to explore for both medical and video game professionals. Um, I'd like to read an excerpt from a letter we received and introduce you to Anna. Annika was six years old and has cystic fibrosis, and this letter that I'm about to read a clip from is from her mom. During Annika's last admission, Child Life brought an Xbox Connect system into her room. Along with that system, they brought in Let's Dance and the Disneyland game. Imagine my surprise to see how much my daughter coughed while doing these games. What a wonderful system. The physiotherapist ordered it to be brought into her room because they had learned that Just Dance can provide an amazing amount cardiac and muscle physio, which in turn helps my daughter clear her lungs of mucus. As a parent, I couldn't help but laugh and cry at the same time. Imagine watching your child having fun dancing and soaring all the time while she's giggling and coughing up mucus. Imagine physio being fun. Imagine your child laughing while hooked up to IVs and gastric tubes. And we're like, wow, that's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, and here's a clip from uh, an Engadget article that was uh, written in March of last year, which was that the American Optomic, uh, Optometric Society had expanded upon its initial praise of the Nintendo 3DS, saying that the audio stereoscopic 3D handheld, quote, could be a godsend for identifying kids under six who need vision therapy. 
And it's funny because Nintendo's warning labels um, originally incited a lot of fear amongst parents, uh, saying that it wasn't safe for young children. But the organization says that kids who can't experience the 3DS to its full potential, uh, that's, that's a sign of amblopia, of, of, of vision, oops, sorry, condition, and, and other vision disorders that can be more easily treated the earlier it's caught. So they're actually using this as a diagnostic tool. Basically, if a kid can't see the 3DS, the, the 3D, there's a problem. I mean, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? This is equipment that we, we already all have this. We're already all using it. We're just learning more about how it can be used. And I think this is really exciting times for our industry. We know these things work, and I know this works. Play has always been a critical component of my own son's journey, and so many of the breakthroughs that we've had with him have come in front of an iPad or a game console. Um, I heard my son, when he was almost four years old, speak his first words, not to me, not to my husband, but to Rami. Does anyone know where Rami's from? <laughs> He's from Castle Crashers, an Xbox Live arcade game up by the Behemoth Studio. And he first started to put together two words while playing Castle Crashers. And it was something we couldn't get him to duplicate in, in a clinical setting for his therapists. And ultimately, we had to record a video of him in front of the Xbox at home and throw it up on YouTube and watch it in the, uh, in the clinic. Uh, and one of his speech pathologists said to us, wow, I wonder how many other kids would be different if we had an Xbox here. And I could see it was one of those light bulb over the moment, you know, over the head moments for her. Uh, and it would be really awesome if we could bring those light bulbs to everybody. So uh, video games in general, what do we have? Uh, even if we're not talking about adaptive technology or, or developmental ther therapy or accessibility or what have you, uh, video games have a really rich fellowship of skills to offer. And these are some of the qualities that have been reported to us as a direct result of having video games available to children in clinical settings. Uh, these are important to children, to all of us, and it's really exciting to look at what else we can do as a community to leverage the tools that we already have. Here are some of the highlights of how game companies traditionally support child's play. Uh, we hold a dinner auction in December every year where we raise on average $200,000 um, or so via rare and unique video game memorabilia auctions. And these, of course, are all things that we'll continue to do, uh, and we're grateful for any support in these areas. They're the backbone of our fundraising initiatives. But what if there was something else we could do, like something more? Right now, our mandate is focused largely on getting video games into hospitals and treatment centers and clinics and what have you. And we're really proud of that mission and proud of what we've accomplished. But we're trying to look ahead of it and wonder what else is possible. What else is possible once clinicians have these platforms? What else is possible when it's your turn? Because as you're making video games, uh, you may not even know this, but you're also making hope. Uh, your hope for the parents of a teenager with a spinal injury, uh, that maybe if he keeps playing we ski, that he'll walk again. Uh, you're creating hope for the teacher of a boy with a learning disability, uh, who sees no greater improvement in his reading skills than when he's playing Super Y Alpha Boost on her cell phone. Um, you're made hope for Annika and her mother who played a dancing game and could breathe again, even if it was just for a little while. Uh, so please remember that when you're creating. Keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, these unintended benefits could become intended benefits with your cooperation if you're thinking about them early enough in your development cycles. Uh, if you were asked by a crazy charity com comprised entirely of diehard video gamers and Ill irrepressible nerds, um, could you take your game into a hospital and help make a sick kid well? And if you can't, would you help us anyway? We hope that you will. And it's been my pleasure to speak to you this morning, and I thank the IGDA for the opportunity to do so. It's been a really inspirational uh, journey for me. If you guys have any questions, you got time. I have a comment. Sure. There was a game idea that I was pursuing in school a little while ago that was basically we wanted to make a connect racer, but we were tired of standing up. So <laughs> it was basically just a connect racer just where you controlled it as if you were using a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And the teacher in the class thought that, you know, we should really pursue that idea. It's like this someone Absolutely. Could use that. Yeah. 
Well, I think saying someone could use that is a really great idea for everything in general. Um, you know, we throw out all these ideas and we're brainstorming, we, we, you know, when you're in your, your pre-production period trying to figure out what you're going to do and what you're going to work on. Saying, you know, can someone use this is a great question to ask yourself. And that's when you're going to start thinking about accessibility issues and that you've diversified your title so that not only is it going to be fun for the mainstream audience, but it's going to have this crazy application that is that you can kind of quietly have on the side. Yeah. And um, that I mean that's a perfect example. And there's I mean there's resources out there for that sort of thing. Um, there's uh, the Able, Able Gamers Association if you're familiar with them. Um, they're uh, one of the biggest advocates for video game accessibility in our industry. And they I mean they can give you information that is super useful on you know what small tweaks do you need to make to a game? I mean or or big things. You know, like okay, well, we're going to make a whole motion game where you're sitting down. Yeah. You know, that's that's a pretty big commitment. Um, but even little things uh, like colorblind palettes or, or or you know support for uh, haptic devices or whatever. There's lots of little things that can be slotted into games um, to make them dual purpose or or even you know that everybody can use. So uh, those are really exciting things to think about and. Um, I, I wish there was more brainstorming along those lines. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. So what uh, efforts do you have in promoting people to make games specifically for your, your demographics that you're looking at? You that, that's, that's nothing that we've um, tackled yet. Uh, we're, our mandate is, as I said before, sort of very much right now on the equipment side of things. Like, let's just get games into hospitals, and and we're not we're not even we we have done some um, initiatives like uh, you know a Falcon controller, which is a haptic controller. Uh, we worked with Falcon a couple of years ago to deliver a bunch of those. Um, but right now, the the emphasis has been for us on the mainstream. I think this is sort of a really new idea of. Well, I'm going to make a game that is specifically to treat traumatic brain injuries or, or something along those lines, um, and that's the kind of thing we're looking for right now to help support. Uh, you know, because if something like that would be a great candidate for us to give a grant to and, and see if that you know we can, we can really work on that. Um, but uh, promoting that right now at this time isn't isn't it's not our primary mission, um, but it's definitely something that we want to integrate more into our program. I'm sorry, I came in late. I had a conference call move, move on me. Um, I was at Games for Change uh, recently, and mm -hmm. one of the challenges is like working with the Endowment for the Arts. They'll only work with nonprofits. Do you grant out to for-profit companies that are doing something in the forward year, or do um, you need to align with a nonprofit? The 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 bulk of our uh, program, which is the hospital wish lists, I mentioned them earlier. We do only partner with nonprofit hospitals, but for our grant program. Our guidelines are very loose, and I mean, it's we are still generally like a, a small charity in terms of our administration and our board, and um, our policy is sort of make a good, make a good case. You know, if if you got a great cause, make a case for us to give you money, and if it if it catches with us, if it's like yeah, this is a great thing, we don't care if they're a profit or a nonprofit. We just want to know can you make something, you know, that's awesome. <laughs> Basically, like it's that's pretty much it for us. It's it's uh, we're not too concerned about um, the other details. We just want to know is this related to our mandate of video games and uh, child welfare. Yeah. Uh, how wide is the um, how wide is the region that you cover with your program? Uh, well, we have. Um, just shy of 80 partner hospitals um, worldwide, and of those, uh, I believe currently 60, 66 or 67 of them are in the U.S. So the majority of them are in the U.S. Uh, we have about eight to ten in Canada. Um, we have a couple in the U.K. We have one in Egypt. We have some in Australia and uh, one in New Zealand. It's, I mean, it's we're kind of all spread out if you're looking at our map, but realistically, the bulk of them are in the U.S. Uh, and all. If you go to childsplaycherry.org, uh, there's a map that has little controllers all over it, and each controller represents a part of the city. 
What do you find is your biggest challenge to me? I would say that our biggest challenge uh, was sort of being taken seriously by the mainstream media um, as a philanthropic organization. Uh, it shedding that idea of um, that we're just a video game charity, and I mean essentially we are. You know, we can't we can't argue that. Uh, but uh, it took a number of years with some pretty big numbers on our website for people, um, mainstream uh, outlets, to actually look at us and go, holy cow, have you seen what this is doing? And I, I think that the video game industry in general is, is uh, has a bit of that where all of a sudden people are stopping and looking and going, uh, total revenue greater than movie and music industries combined? How did that happen? And yeah, well, that's, that's where we're at now. And I think that my time's up. Thank you very much for coming.